This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Ticket Volume is proud to present three leaders in the service management industry to discuss the future of ITSM. Before I introduce our guests, I need to make a quick announcement that the podcast is changing. We're excited to be bringing you a new format and more value with less noise so that you can listen more and learn more. Listen less and learn more. <laughs> so if you don't see us in January, it's because we're working hard on something new and you're going to want to subscribe to Ticket Volume because some of our content, like attending our live episodes, is going to be for members only. So register today at TicketVolume.com. Now, on to our guests. Claire Agatar is known for being pragmatic and clear. Claire is a service management trainer, consultant, and author, nominated as one of Computer Weekly's top 50 women in tech, and is the chief architect for Verism. She leads a team for e-learning on topics like ITIL, DevOps, SIAM, Verism, as well as the body of knowledge for SIAM Foundation. And she's a professional as part of Scopism, of course. She's also the host of the popular live ITSM show called ITSM Crowd, so check that out. Mark Smalley is known for his writing, which is bountiful, from his recent and very popular Reflections on XLA to his many contributions to ITIL. Mark has contributed and authored so many great books. He's also a consultant trainer with a dizzying speaking schedule, and he has held several advisory and ambassador roles, along with a strong tenure and history of operations development and IT roles. Rob England, our third guest, was known for being the IT skeptic, but if you haven't noticed, his content has way too much optimism now, so he had to drop the moniker. He is a top voice for new ways of working and also author to many great titles and concepts. One of my favorites, Standard and Case, which has now been reincarnated as Response Taiji, and also his latest release with Dr. Cherry Vu is Working Naked, which tackles the various ways to visualize work, data, and so much more. Welcome to Ticket Volume Live, where good service is good business. And these episodes are an opportunity to be the news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host and nerd, Matt Barron. Each week, I get to geek out with leaders to share their insights on service management, technology, business, and this episode is going to bring that same energy. I hope you've had a good week, and I also hope that you'll get involved today. Ask a question in chat. Provide an insight in chat while we're speaking. We'll be on the chat too, and maybe your chats and questions will be featured. So for now, though, let's begin. Welcome, Claire, Mark, and Rob to Ticket Volume. Hello. Hello. What an esteemed panel we have here. We are not going to waste any time because this is such an important topic and people are curious uh, for, for selfish reasons and for altruistic reasons because service management has been surprised, I'll say. That's a bold claim. But I think that we've been surprised by many changes. Um, I'll use DevOps as, a, as an example. And that those changes can be really uncomfortable and, and dangerous. And it can hurt people. Um, not, not physically necessarily, but it might they might lose their lunch over it. So uh, let's talk about it and connect and share and help each other through the chaos. So what do you guys think? I need to know what you think is service management's saving grace. What is the hope? What keeps you coming back for more? And I'm going to put you on the spot, Mr. Rob England, because you have that faraway look in your eyes. Like <laughs> you definitely have a thought here brewing. The saving grace of service management is that it's never going to go away. It is, it's not a model of, how we do work, it is the description. And so, um, you know, if we take IT service management specifically and, um, and the practices that we know and love, I mean, 
we talk about nobody does problem management, but mm. everybody does problem management. Mm. It's just they might do it at maturity 0.5, but every one of the practices that service management describes exist and 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 are happening somewhere in the organization. And so, yeah, it's not a model, it's the model. It's a description of reality. And so how we approach it and how we think about it might change, but service management is always going to be there and be thought about and need to be need to be thought about and considered so we'll always be having these philosophy of work discussions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that was really great um and a great way to start the episode like look you don't actually have to be afraid of losing your job you know the industry's innovating and changing all around us all the time but in reality, a lot of the stuff just can't go away. I mean, even the shift to cloud, for example, a lot of people thought that that was going to change IT. Oh, the whole thing can be outsourced. Well, it gets outsourced to people still. So there's always going to be jobs and careers in it. Claire, Mark, do you have something that you want to add to that? Yeah, certainly. And you're, you're disturbingly chirpy, Matt. Always. <laughs> for me, it's 11, 11 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> And we thank you for joining us so late. Yeah, oh, that's, right, that's right. I had to sleep this afternoon to prepare for it. Mm. The situation is hopeless. We must take the next step. That's a quote by the, the cellist uh, Pablo Casals when faced with a particularly difficult situation in his country. The situation is hopeless. We must take the next step. thought that was a nice, uh, nice quote to to start it off with. And another quote is uh, somewhat more inspirational. The future is William Gibson. Um, the future is already here. It's not, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Mm. So there are in the industry, there are pockets of, of sort of future stuff going on already. Look at, uh, you know, one of my babies, ITIL High Velocity IT, that although it's the most progressive ITIL book, around i think you know itil i think rob said this itil is always a lagging indicator it describes established best practice so it contains stuff like agile and devops and flow and value streams things like that service science dealing with complexity those kind of topics and of course it, not everybody is doing all of that at once but people are doing this and this is encouraging the xla stuff that you mentioned um people are looking at the effect of IT on people in the business. I find that encouraging. So it, it's certainly, um, it's, it's people taking the outside in perspective. I find find that encouraging. So a couple of things to think about to uh, dr draw hope from. I love it. Claire, where do you find hope? I did. The, the thing that hit me immediately thinking about this is the concept of community because I've been in service management kind of 20 plus years now and th there's never been a point where there hasn't been some element of community supporting me. So very early days, um, going to kind of BCS presentations, getting involved in IT service management forums, going to conferences and that's never gone away. You have things like this webinar um you know my my youtube channel rob's blog when rob was the it skeptic which was incredibly um influential to me i used to to read it you know max max books which you publish your financial data and it's it's a labor of love at the moment i think it's fair to say mark but there are that there are just this 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 massive group of super intelligent people who want to contribute, collaborate, drive this thing forward, ask the questions without looking necessarily for how do I get paid my my day rate for this. So that's that's kind of the thing that that gives me hope is that there will always be these super enthusiastic people in the service management space who want to be involved, want to share their experience, want to bring the new people forward with them and when these big questions do arise when things change there, there there's always going to be people who are ready to have that conversation and I think that's that's something that is 
I don't know if it's unique to our industry, but um, I've, I've not found it as much in some of the other areas that I've, I've worked in through, through my career. Yeah, yes. it's a generous community. It's a generous mm. community. It so mm. is. Yeah. Well put. Well put. And to toot your horn for you, Claire, the, the Siam community is a perfect example. You know, it's where people can share. If you haven't heard of the Siam community, definitely check it out, especially if you source any part of your business or any part of your operations. It is a great way to Gosh, it's like publishing your salaries. It's really like showing, <laughs> isn't it? It's like showing behind the scenes, like, hey, this is how much I pay. This is what I get. Uh, here's here's the vendors that I selected from. It's all this insider information. And it, I really love your answer because, again, I'm a part of the community. I feel the love mm -hmm. when I need it, you know? Um, so hopefully those of you in the community that are joining here today have some questions. Pop them into chat. Um, and just a quick note too, on mental health, you are in a stressful industry. So hopefully you are taking time for what you need or asking for what you need from the loved ones around you. Um, if you're having any mental health struggles, um, and you need someone to talk to, feel free to get in my DMS, slide on in there. Um, I've, everyone struggles with this. I struggle with it. So um, if you're if you're looking for help, we're here for you. Alan's got a great question to kick us off. AI, it's a popular topic. Where do we see the human factor being impacted the most? AI becomes more of a reality in our environment. So do we think that AI... Uh, no, I'm going to kill the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. AI is not coming for our jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Depends what your job is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so take that, Claire. What jobs do you think are are at the most uh, risk, or what roles and functions will shrink down and be given AI? Um, I I, th I think risk is is an interesting term because there is a a, a personal risk. You know, if you work in a support role and there's an AI bot being trained up to do your job there is a risk associated with that. But looking at it industry-wide, looking at it as a society, it's it's trying to find the opportunities rather than the risks because the, the, the jobs that can be completely automated are, you know, 90% automated, re replaced by AI, and not necessarily the most fulfilling work. So how do we evolve ourselves forward so that when jobs have been replaced, then there is meaningful work for other people to do? And I've been watching the um, AI in the art space recently. There's a lot of been people been generating AI art and even improving some of the famous paintings that we all love. And yes, but I, I think AI can show us what's actually in that window. And safe to say, I think if you're an artist, perhaps you're uh, you, you're safe from AI. But it, but it's you know it, it's it's an evolution. We talk about these these shifts, these industrial revolutions. AI is another part of that. And the, the element I think that worries me is the fact that legislation, government thinking is not keeping pace with technological change. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the biggest question is how do we look at this as a society and make sure that people are protected and not left behind when AI can take a role from a human worker when we're talking about deploying digital workers what happens to those human workers and i would love to get into universal basic income and all the rest of it but i don't think that's within the the scope for today's chat but there there is there is more fulfilling work that we can do i i keep I keep saying I am waiting for the day when a robot can do my job. <laughs> we'll, uh, I will welcome that robot in with open arms. But but I think that, yes, that there is a change that is coming. Um, is it happening right now? Perhaps AI isn't quite as advanced as we think we are, as we think it is. But really, there's 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 planning that needs to be done, and that's within organisations, within societies, to look at 
how we adapt to that shift and and you know protect people yeah I, I when you were talking about it i was thinking about the jobs to be done and how um really that's the stuff that's going to start picking off first right mm -hmm. like i've got this knowledge article to write i don't have time spit spit it out for me take it steal it churn it a bit for human sake and then publish it like it's going to be uh you know different things like that you're peeling that off of the to-do list you're pulling you're pulling that off the kanban board and saying okay ai can do this ai can do that but at what point does it take a, uh, an entire human's job i think that's yet mm. to be determined and the, there's an i think there's an integrity element as well because i i think back to kind of when we were first setting up our training website which is 16 years ago and at the time everything was about seo everything's about seo so our web developer would say to me you know write me a blog article that basically says ITIL training in as many different configurations as you can and i think even to the point where we had text that was in white on a white background so that, <laughs> you know humans couldn't see it but google google would scroll it and it was it, it, it was it was trash written yeah. to be read by machines and i think that the danger with allowing ai to produce your content um is that eventually are we just creating stuff that looks reasonable to be consumed by machines. I, I think that there's, yeah, there, there's a, there's an integrity question behind it as well. And, and you know, I think it, it's a slightly different example, but in the UK, we have the um, the self-checkouts in the supermarkets mm -hmm. and, you know, you can, you can go and do, do somebody's job for them. I love that because I don't have to talk to anybody. I can just do my own checkouts. But there are there are supermarkets now that are pulling that technology out because they've switched the focus back to the customer experience. And mm -hmm. we actually want to chat to our customers and spend a little bit of time with them. So that there's that there's that kind of element to think about it as as well. And and it's these these decisions are not just about what's cheapest what's fastest mm -hmm. our our services are consumed by humans in the main that that example that you give there claire is a good one though that <clears throat> the human system is self-correcting so we're very good at extrapolating to apocalyptic outcomes and mm. the media loves to extrapolate to but the reality is that we've been automating for 10,000 years in various mm -hmm. different ways. And society evolves not just to accept the new automation and work around it, but also to limit and constrain and adapt the automation to how we want to live. So mm -hmm. AI will be no different, I think, that... Um, uh, as you say, people are going saying, I don't want to work for the supermarket i don't want to do self-checkout and some days i do some days i want to go through the self-checkout and other days i want a human to do it for me so automation is just offering an alternative but the human element there's still a demand for that so mm -hmm. you know i think we'll see those or matt talking about auto generating content um i auto generate a lot of content now and in fact our next book you know um chat gpt is going to write a fair bit of the next book but that what comes out of it is often rubbish. So all that automation, any form of automation, and AI is just another form of automation, all that automation ever does for us is make us superhuman. Mm -hmm. All it does is extend our capabilities and, and grow them without replacing them. So that does mean that individuals' jobs, well, like, you know, five people can now do what 20 people used to do because yeah. we're now superhuman, because we now have an increased capacity um, to, to crank through the same amount of work. Um, but that displacement just means that that human potential is used somewhere else. You know, mm -hmm. like the number of people working in agriculture now is what, 1% of what it was 10,000 years ago? But that doesn't mean 99% of the human race is unemployed. It just yeah. means that that we're doing something different now mm. you know so i you know i don't like ex apocalyptic extrapolations of, of any technology i think that assumes the society is this passive truck rolling off a cliff and we're not we're, we're active interactive community society that 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 
takes these problems on and and, mm. and controls and adapts them. And it's it's it still feels to me like solutions looking for problems. So talking about oh I've got Chat GPT, what can I do with it? Is is the backwards question and i think if if we look at it from the perspective of how do we make our jobs more meaningful how do we make our lives better our society better and what role does technology play in that that's a much more valid question than saying you know we we've, we've, we've got this cool stuff now what are we going to do with it yeah yeah, one of the commenters here on the stream says, I don't think AI is the problem, but humans intentionally enjoy handing over <laughs> everything to AI. Not wrong, Latana. Thanks for joining in. And you're you're totally right. Like I love seeing what it can and cannot do. The latest um model from Google, the Gemini model, very fascinating concept using multi-modes, language, video. Mark, I see you nodding your yeah. head. You must be on board with this stuff. Yeah. Well, in fact, just just half an hour ago, I watched uh, I watched a video about uh, Gemini. It's crazy, absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. But I I just going back to AI in general. I like the moral questions that it raises. Questions like, you know, should you should you should you questions should you use Chat GPT to help you or to write a letter of condolence to a good friend. Yeah. yeah and, and what, what will we, how will we think about that in 10 years time? Mm. People are intrinsically, you know, we like to, you could say lazy, we like to save energy. So we like to take the easy way if possible. If Rob, you know, if you've got G, chat GPT to generate some content for you, how seriously are you gonna look at that yeah, it looks okay. Let's publish it. Those kind of questions. We're going to be seduced by the the convenience that it offers, and that's uh, that's quite a challenge. Yeah, I have to agree with that. It is seductive to say the least. And so often, I will. I, I'm using it for social all the time. Make a post about this. Um, include these points. Make it interesting. I go and read what it wrote, and I'm like, okay, I would never use that word. That's not a phrase I would use. Like I can see all the things that are not me in it very quickly. Now, granted, I'm giving it very simple prompts, but I think the the point is that you can't trust it wholeheartedly. And if you do, you're going to look like a fool with a tool. <laughs> but you can't trust any tool wholeheartedly, right? No. And so to me, uh, chat GPT is no more threatening than a spell checker. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just a glorified spell checker and and um i've resist you know i hate the american spell checkers that keep trying to tell me to write color without a u in it and and so i find the way to tell it damn it i'm writing in 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 new zealand english and i'll spell that or, and, and z in an organization I, you know so i've adapted those tools to not impose their assumptions of spelling and grammar on me and and the same thing will is happening with chat gpt you you know if, if you spew out some text and you don't like the style matt next time when the prompts say in the style of matt Barron, mm. generate an article to da da and you'll quickly see improvement right so um no i'm not going to just take text that comes out of it and publish it as a book but it's it's going to save me 50% of the effort in writing that text before I even begin to edit it and restructure it. And and it's going to come up with two bullet points that I didn't even think of. Yeah. I'm going to go, oh, wow, you know, in the list of 10 things I was going to, or eight things I was going to write about, now I've got 10. Because ChatGPT is actually taking a more comprehensive and universal view of the thing than my poor old brain can. So it's actually improving what I would have written, not degrading it. You know, it, it's all it's all about how we embrace these tools, and not whether the tool itself is a threat. Mm. Yeah, and embracing it with 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 human human properties, human characteristics, with mm. sort of seeing the long term consequences, the, the wisdom when you're faced with something ambiguous, you know, which is better, intuition, those kind of qualities. If you add those to, um, you know, I think that those are the kind of things we should focus on. Fascinating topic. 
Yeah, exactly. Tim pointed it out in the comments here. Every time I hear about technology reducing friction, I think that in the formula, friction just means humans doing work, which is fine until we're talking about work that humans do well, right? I remember when chatbots first became a thing, virtual <laughs> agents became a thing. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I was working on a service desk and I was frightened that it would take my job and then i saw the quality and i realized there's no way this thing is even going to get close to the to the amount of empathy that i can portray through the phone you know smiling voice and so um i, I think this is kind of that that same form uh we've got another comment here from sophie with the use of ai particularly for writing processes or documents there's a risk that it removes that human interaction that personal touch and there needs to be a balance between an effective use of time with the need to actually engage with people ah oh, it's offensive to think that these computers could en engage with people to the level that we can but here she has a good question what are the key things that service management professionals should do to keep up with the ever evolving world of itsm thank you sophie for proposing this question because mm -hmm. i think it's the question that it's this the episode, question. It's, it's the question mm -hmm. it's the reason we put this together so let's go around what 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 do you think what are the things that service management professionals should do to keep up mark a uh, couple of things come to mind. Just look, taking a work, several steps back, just thinking about what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, climate disruption, of course. How does that translate into IT, IT service management? Thinking about sustainability, but also continuity. How are you going to react when climate disruption disrupts work? So more attention for so be aware of what's going on uh, within countries, uh, political instability, some countries more than others. Think about cybersecurity risks. So trying to try to identify the the sort of global trends, translate those those uh, into consequences into knowledge areas that you should you should be looking at. So that's, that's one of the things and. I think another another thing, and it's pretty close to my heart. You see that uh, that little orange book on our bit bookshelf there. This is marketing, Seth Godin, thinking about how to um, how to articulate and demonstrate the value of IT better, because I think we're we're poor at that. And one of the examples that comes to mind is the m many of you will have seen it. I think the, the Wolf of Wall Street and the sell me this pen scene where aspiring salespeople try to sell the teacher a pen and they make the mistake of, of focusing on the features of the pen and not the benefits and that's what we often do in it we, we talk about the the internals instead of the externals there's a marketing guy rory sutherland look him up he's a fascinating guy he says um uh, what's he say? Um, a flower is a weed with a marketing budget. <laughs> <laughs> I translate in, into IT. I translate as a feature as a bug with a marketing budget. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he talks, he's got a great, he's got wonderful stories about marketing things. He talks about landing at an, air, landing at an airport and realizing that, that a bus is going to pick you up, which makes you feel like a second class citizen. But he says, hang on, if the flight attendant were to say, ladies and gentlemen, we've arrived at the airport, the bus is going to pick us up shortly. That means that you won't have to walk 400 yards to pick your baggage up because we'll drop you off right outside the baggage area. You think, oh, that's wonderful. Now, nothing has actually changed. The bus is still coming to pick you up, but you've reframed it in terms of advantages, benefits that you hadn't seen, seen earlier. We do that so poorly in, in IT. I think we could, something I'd like people to think about, how can you apply marketing principles to, um, um, to achieve more value, more perceived value? Love it. Okay, Rob, what do you think people need to pay attention to, service management professionals specifically? 
Well, I agree with Mark about, you know, the global perspective. I love the phrase VUCA, you know, volatile, uncertain, complicated. We say complicated and ambiguous. The world is increasingly VUCA and the stability of the late 20th century is way behind us now. And, and so the world is not a stable place. And this idea of stabilized production environments ceased to be real 20 years ago, actually. But, you know, we've got to just let go of this whole idea of control and stability, which is so baked through service management and accept change as the state. Change is not an event that happens. Change is the permanent condition in which we work and and that inversion of our thinking and service management is essential and i fall forward did a lot of that inversion but um that's i think that's one huge thing impacting service management is is inverting to accept change as the condition not an event um and the other one is the is the shift in i would say being the hippie i am in enlightenment moving away from process thinking to humanistic thinking and so understanding that systems are people and not machines and letting go of command and control and and you know the service management people talk a lot about how do we make people do x mm. and trying to compel people to follow process or fill in the form or use the right code which is a complete failure to understand how humans work. So, yeah. um, you know, I think there's a couple of major inversions in thinking that are happening in the world of work, of IT work and service management. You know, Mark, Mark's right. You know, I've always called EITL a lagging indicator. EITL is always lumbering along a decade behind <laughs> with these things. Um, uh and may and may cease to lumber at all going forward we might talk about that at some point. let's do um but but uh service management generally kind of is not a leading industry i would say so there's a couple of things we need to catch up on one is 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 the vuca nature of the world and the other is is is, is hum actually and a third one sorry clear but a third one, humanistics and the third one would be complexity Mm. that since the 1990s we've started to really understand chaos and complexity mm. and so let go of thinking of the world as simple linear systems that we can um that we can model and predict what they're going to do and understand that even our it systems are not that that they're complex systems they have the capacity to endlessly surprise us and 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 you know we ride a tiger we don't lead a horse in in the real world yeah your comments are hitting home with the audience change is the only constant mm -hmm. i have to agree um so <clears throat> so what are for those three things what about you clear i think to, to come back to sophie's question and hi sophie sophie's not too far from me um what are the key things that service management professionals should do to keep up with the ever-evolving oh, world yeah. of ITSM? And I think if you'd asked me this even six months, a year ago, I would have, you know, said, just, just keep learning. Just keep reading. Just keep learning. There's new stuff coming out all the time. You know, do you know about DevOps, Lean, Agile, this, that, whatever it might be? And I, I don't know if it's maybe information overload or i'm reaching an age where my my brain is starting to creak but i still think that's valid and i still think you know curiosity is is the number one skill that's going to help you in this instance but i would say you know be curious keep learning but consume with purpose so maybe looking at that context that that mark was talking about and then specifically trying to find the things that are going to help you in that particular instance because if not you know it, it's 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 kind of like when you go onto youtube and you you start with a video on how to improve your change management process and before you know it you're learning how to relag your boiler or 
grub bigger <laughs> potatoes you know you, you've gone down a complete rabbit hole so i think be you know be appreciative of, of the fact that there is so much amazing information out there but keep your own agenda in mind and and align the learning and the, the skills that you you prioritize with the the situations that that you face would would be my advice for that one yeah but give yourself permission to be playful as well mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. one of the things i in the idle high velocity it book that i wrote with 20 other people i asked mike orzen lean guy lean it guy yeah. give me a 101 on on lean you know, not the regular 101 you learn every, you read everywhere, but the, the guy who's been to the mountain and back, you know, he's the gold plated 101. And he came up with some great concepts, one of which was playfulness as being part of lean culture. Mm -hmm. I thought there was really, uh, you know, talk about human beings as opposed to artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. playfulness. So, and on that thing, oh, sorry, can, can inspire stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that on that theme, too. Thanks for bringing us back, Claire. It was um, is, is open mindedness. So service management tends to be a very conservative community. It's part of that lagging nature, trying to define generally accepted practice, at least if not best. And and this is not the time for conservativeness. So I'm thinking particularly that um, I think service management is being reinvented. And a lot of that reinvention is coming out of the DevOps community and the work of Richard Cook and John Allspore and 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 people like and Gene Kim's inner circle and um, and I remember when they did a paper on incident management a couple of years ago and the huffing and fuffing that went on from the established ITSM community <laughs> over that paper I, I found hilarious because it, you know it may not have been. I think we could see a few holes in it from our long term. But on the other hand, it also offered a lot of insights and a lot of energy and new directions for ITSM. And yet the reaction to it was just one of who are they to, to tell us, you know, and, and, and I thought that was a shame, really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that one up because yeah. that's one on my, one on, that's one on my list. <clears throat> Certainly diversity of concepts, explore everything. There's, you've all given good examples of industries to steal from already um, in this podcast, because we just do it. We do it by nature because we've learned to do it. And then I really like the, the concept of discipline, having the discipline to, to stay curious about something that can be really boring, like problem management, for example, you know, how many ways can you slice a fish up? Um, an Ishikawa diagram is one of them, yeah. But there's lots of other ways to do the five whys, the the other ways to to pick apart a problem. And it's hard to stay. It's hard to have focus because we get drawn into those generative AI discussions. We get distracted by the new shiny thing, and so so often, I think it's really important that we that we keep that discipline. Um, and I've got a question that someone has DM'd me directly. And um, I, I'll read it out because I can't bring it up on the screen. But what new concepts, methodologies, or approaches do you predict or forecast coming up? <laughs> That's a tough one, right? Because um, like, what are you stealing from currently? Right now, like every, almost everything that I'm doing, I'm speaking about and, and writing and thinking about is stealing from experience management, experience design, design thinking, human-centered design. Um, and a lot of that is just because that's part of like, I just like that stuff. So I'm curious about it and love to read about it. What what are you learning about right now that you, that is that you can't wait to dig in deeper on? Zen complexity. Buddhism? Yeah, <laughs> complexity. So, um, you know, going back to service management and the future is probably coming from different people than we've looked to in the past. Um, you know, Richard Cook, who passed away recently, um, I think was, was contributing more than anyone to the future of 
service mm -hmm. management um, before he died, at least, you know, right up there in the top. And, um, you know, one of the concepts that he blew my brain away with was the idea that our IT systems are, in fact, just abstractions that we build in our minds. And the only evidence we have of what they're actually doing is a few screens we can see and a few reports that we can run. And everything else is this huge blob of digital information that is completely invisible to us. The noughts and ones are flashing by millions of times a second. We have no idea what's really happening in there. We just build these abstractions in our mind, these models of what we think is happening inside that IT system. And your mental model is different to mine. Yeah. Every person has a completely different abstraction of what they think the machine is doing. Yeah, and nobody, crazy, nobody it, knows. Yeah, it, even a, a basic concept like um, in IT service management, like an incident. An incident doesn't actually exist. It's just a social construct. Huh? And, and what happened in that incident, everybody has a different theory. Because everyone yeah. has a different mental model of the machine. Yeah, yeah. 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 He introduced introduced the concept of uh, the the world as found, the system as found, versus mm. the system as imagined. Yes. Mm. And we most of us work in the in the space of the system as imagined. We work with information and people, certainly in IT service management and not with the actual technical system itself. We just talk about the system. And our we, systems we are so, it's yeah, crazy. That, system, that system is so almost infinitely complicated that if you wanted to describe the system as found, you would have to stop everything for a year <laughs> and have hundreds of people unpacking and describing and documenting and recording what was happening in that one second would take hundreds of people a year to describe the actual system as found. It is technologically impossible to ever, ever have a CMDB. It's technologically yeah. impossible to ever, ever have a true picture of what is really happening in that machine because it's just so complicated now. Yeah, no, so so that takes us back to Zen Buddhism. I think, Matt, you, mm. you've just brought it up. So we have, we have to accept that life is about suffering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that thing you did, Mark. And, yeah, and the, 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 you know, the four yeah. noble truths of service suffering. First yeah, yeah, truth. That was great. There is suffering. Just accept that service sucks. IT service <laughs> sucks. People suffer from IT systems and services. That's a good starting point. Then you go, go down the path. You know, you've got the eight, in Buddhism, you've got the eightfold path to, to explore the, um, you know, how you identify suffering and the path to the, solving it it's something to think about in fact i i wrote an article on linkedin about that look it up service suffering. yeah put the link in matt it, it, i think the time i spend in vietnam might be influencing me but and um, you know that there's a lot about learning to let go and especially in service management we have this culture of control and 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 discipline and learning to just let it go and understand that we will never have a true picture of what's happening in the system. No, we will never is... have zero risk. We will never have, you know, you can make every production change potentially will destroy the organization. That's just a fact. Yeah, but we, we do have this sense of responsibility. We're aware of the consequences when things go wrong. It makes people nervous and the gut instinct is to control things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's you know contraintuitive to, to to let things go. That's a that's a real in in your terms, Rob, a real inversion. It's totally. Claire, are you studying Zen Buddhism too? Don't tell me. <laughs> I think so. Point one: um, new webinar series, service management philosophers. Mark and Rob should absolutely, <laughs> I would watch that, take that on forward. <laughs> and I think <laughs> this, if I'm honest, this is my worry about guesting alongside these two um, giant intellects because <laughs> they exist on a, on a different plane to me. But it's a different level. But the, 
the the area that I'm thinking about is um, I'm thinking more about business and how how we run a good business and what a good business looks like and the elements of that that are enabled, created, delivered by technology. And a lot of this is, you know, Matt, you mentioned I work in the Siam space. So a lot of that is thinking about the sourcing that we do and how that influences business. But it's, you know, I've I've been I've been a small business owner for 17 years now. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but learned a lot of things as well. And that's that's the the space that I'm in now is is thinking about business and 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 what business means and the 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 technology part of our of our business model our business map is is just part of that but of of course it's it's such an essential part now so um not not quite suffering but um but that's 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 my headspace at the moment and i i think to again to try and come back to the question i'm i'm not and and i I think I see this in the industry as well, which is that we've seen a bit of a slowdown in new things, new products, methodologies, whatever it might be. Feels like there's been a bit of a slowdown in that and a shift to more focus on what are some principles that can help us? How do we look at value? How do we look at outcomes, experience? And you know, then what methodologies, frameworks, etc., can we draw on to help us do that? But but in terms of new things coming, I I don't know how much more development we'll see in that space beyond evolution of the the things that already exist. And I think if we look back, you know, if we look back twenty years to when I first started in service management, ITIL was pretty much the only thing. And it feels like ever since then, people have been trying to invent the new ITIL and there will never be mm. a product that has that dominance. Even ITIL isn't the new ITIL anymore yeah. because of everything else that exists in the space. So it, it it's that's a change, I think, uh, since really since what? DevOps and Agile, I don't think there's been mm. anything that's 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 gained that level of momentum. You, yeah, you joke about us in my groovy IT service management framework. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> it was good. But, but groovy colors. You, you, do, you joke about us being on a higher plane, Claire, but I think the reason we see that slowdown is because people are society people work work philosophy is evolving to think at higher levels. And so ITIL is just a commodity yeah. mm -hmm. and that's why people sort of treating it the way it is because it's just it's BAU it's just part of table stacks yeah and as we hygiene and so as we move forward you know it, that was the most advanced thing 20 years mm -hmm. ago and before that the most advanced thing was computer tape I don't know right so we've gone through technology and process and we've evolved beyond process and methodology that all that stuff just noise now and you still need it but the the thinking is all as everyone's alluded to is people centric now i love you saying it's about principles and values claire because that is absolutely where we're moving forward to is thinking about mm -hmm. not how do we do these things but why do we do them mm. you know and how should we you know, people have talked in the AO context about how should we. So it, it, it's why do we do these things and how should we do them rather than how do we do them? We've moved beyond that. That's just kind of what you do. Yeah, I, Rob, we, we could philosophize about the transcendentals, couldn't we? What was it? Good, goodness, beauty, and um, what was the other one? Truth. Yeah, yeah right. What, yeah. What, what's true, beautiful, and good? That drives me every day. That's what... <laughs> That's what I come back to every day is that everything we do must be not just true, which is the process thing, not just truthy, but also good, ethical, and beautiful, satisfying to the human side. Mm. And and I, I think I'll just say one more thing on this, Matt. Sorry, Pam. Oh, no, let's go. But, um, 
I, I think th there's one thing which um, is worth touching on here and this, this conversation highlights it is one thing that I do think is there is a a fundamental difference between the conversations that we have in the service management sphere and behavior in the tech industry as a whole. And I think if we look at the some of the, the tech giants, the unicorns, how they are run, how they treat their people, their ethics, their values, it it's pretty rubbish. And sometimes it feels like we are almost navel gazing and there are things happening out in the real world that we are struggling to to influence and I think that the, the tech industry as a whole does not necessarily live up to the values that 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 we try and discuss yeah it ties it back to one of the more fundamental points that you brought up earlier basic uh, universal basic income fundamental things like the um, the redistribution of wealth and what constitutes meaningful and rewarding work mm. if you know your current kind of work is is taken away we've got you know many people associate their identity as their work so what's who am i e existential questions even it's fascinating how we've kind of come full circle in the tech industry that silicon valley used to be the liberal enlightened mm. cool place and now the tech giants are part of the rise global rise of fascism to be frank and people like musk and zuckerberg and bezos represent the worst of humanity not the best and and so the technology has swung from this super liberal left wing to this ultra right bro culture community. And, and, you know, I think that's what you're talking about, or some of what you're talking about, Claire, is that's the elephant in the room is that IT technology, IT culture um, is, uh, I think corporate culture always was pretty yeah. horrible, but yeah but not in this ultra right wing way that we see now and 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 the hostility to to women and to liberal thinking and 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 so on is 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 a major issue in our industry totally mm. yes let the future be female please <laughs> all of my best mentors in the technology space have been female and I couldn't, um, I couldn't go another minute without saying it. <laughs> you need a bit well, more well, diversity there, Matt. Say that again. Femi you need a bit more diversity in your mental. Oh yeah, that's true. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but stereotypically feminine culture. So Dana Ardi wrote a book uh, in the '90s called um, the, "The The Fall of the Alphas." that, um, you know, talking about alpha and beta culture, which has entered the language a little bit, you know, so alpha is stereotypically male and beta is stereotypically female, but I like to think of myself as a beta person. I mean, it's not tied to your actual gender, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, so yeah, you let the future be beta, whether it's women or mm. men who are, who Love are it. driving it, mm. right? Yes, I love that. Okay, the amount of questions that have come in over the last 10 minutes or so, there's there's a lot of them. Um, some really great ones. I really like this one from Stin. Depart from ITSM, drop the IT from the abbreviation. And I, I think a lot of us on this call have definitely done that. Um, this community needs to reinvent itself as service management professionals. And I think this is totally on on point. I think it's something that a lot of us in the industry have been kind of working towards, not with not with great fervor, but I think we all see that there's this way to apply service management beyond IT that really could serve other departments without us being complete bigots about the whole thing. Um, and there's a ton more in here too, like beyond that. 
Uh, I really like this one from Tim. As a liberal arts flavored nerd, I think we need cross training to learn how to speak the various languages that create and maintain silos. Mm -hmm. nice. Kind of goes to Claire's comment, like let's learn how to run a business. Um, uh, it's interesting and upsetting that ethics has only become a central technology topic in the context of AI, as opposed to the other ethical decisions that our businesses need to um, consider. Fabulous point, Tim. It's yeah, clear that true. Tim spent some time thinking about this. <laughs> um, here's a couple of questions that are real pointed towards that maybe we can provide some context on. The service management mash getting more complex. Okay, that isn't what I thought it was. Um, but this one specifically, is root cause analysis dead or should we focus on the interactions between complex systems? That's one for Rob. I was going to say the same thing, Mark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's well, dead, and yes, we should. Yep. Yeah, no, 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 no. Just, just a slight nuance on that. It, it is a question of scale. If you're dealing with a small part of the system, you'll have a you'll have a higher degree of of predictability. So it does it does it's it's not it's not absolute. It's not completely unpredictable. It's on a spectrum. And to I'm, hopefully, I'm a, oh, go ahead. I'm a mad fan of watching air crash investigation videos and shows. Mm -hmm. And every air crash requires three things to go wrong. Every un You need three things to cause an unplanned landing. And you remove any one of those three or more things, and the plane will land safely. So there is no root cause to any incident. There's right. always at least three causes. And the one we designate as the root cause has always been a political decision, not a technological mm. one. Mm -hmm. And and I've been saying that since the IT skeptic started 17, 20 years ago. So um, it's not just my understanding of complexity that makes me say that. I've, I've always said that root cause is a political decision. And and so you can re you can remove a root cause of an incident, but the three things that happen to cause that or more that happen to cause that incident the probability that those particular three things will come in it's the swiss cheese model which has been yeah. around forever mm -hmm. the probability that those three things will happen in conjunction again was probably fairly low and and so by removing the root cause you will reduce the number of future combinations that could possibly cause an incident but you won't reduce the number of future incidents you'll just so we should be we should remove causes. There's nothing wrong with removing causes, but let's not create the illusion that we're preventing that thing from happening again. Bingo. That's it right there. Don't delude yourself into into comfort. <laughs> so, so the important thing is is resilience. The important yeah. thing is to build our systems on the assumption that they're going to fail. Yeah. You know, another great Richard Cook quote was i'm not surprised that your system failed i'm surprised that it ever worked at all yeah <laughs> right all of our systems are broken all the time you know there isn't one person on this call whose production environment doesn't have defects in it yeah mm -hmm. and doesn't have known risks and doesn't have technological debt and so all our systems are broken all the time we should stop building on the assumption that we can prevent them breaking and build them on the assumption they're going to break all the time Ah. Yeah, everybody on the call should look up uh, Richard Cook's paper, Why Complex Systems Fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. Only about how, how complex systems fail. Yeah. How, how complex systems yeah. fail. It's about six pages. Fabulous. It's really. even got its own website now. Seminal how how dot complex systems dot fail, right? It's yeah. wonderful. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. I think I printed that one off as soon as I saw it. Um, I'd also like to bring back the our friend, the four-letter acronym. If ITIL is a commodity, why do so many organizations struggle with the basics? Pink mentioned their most popular courses are still operational in nature. What do, what do oh. we think about the the relevance of ITIL going forward? Claire, I'll let you 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 field this one. I do, and 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 I, I would love to talk to this one because again, I think there is a slight disconnect between the conversations that we have and and the, the level of maturity within the service management sphere and what is happening out there in the real world and 
while we're having these amazing conversations about fragile systems and where the root cause actually exists, there are still organizations and I work with them regularly who are struggling with instant problem change. You know, they're struggling to have a self-service portal that works. And what's what's happened in recent years with with particularly I'm using the term best practice. I know it's I know it's not perfect, but the the the, the things that are published is it's become a lot less prescriptive because we 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 want to give people options we want to allow people to reach something that that matches the environment that they work within but i think for for the basics for the essentials and you know this is where ITIL has always done i believe it's it's best work is there is a need for an element of prescription in what we advise people to do and you can see that in the way that now a lot of these processes can be delivered out of the box by the, the software solutions that we use. So again, when I when I first started in service management, the whole thing was, you know, you designed these astonishingly complicated processes and then you picked some part tool provider and forced them to adapt and customize to your horrific process that you developed. Whereas now you can work with a solution provider who can help you do these things out of the box. but if you haven't got those basics to a workable level, you haven't got the time, the energy, the resilience to think about the more complex things. So um, I completely agree, Mitch, that there are still a lot of organizations that are struggling with the basics. And and that's where I think what we think of as, as, as traditional service management and, and, you know, maybe, it's still there in ITIL 4 in the practice guides, but it was more explicit in ITIL version 3 and even more explicit in ITIL version 2. But th- there is still a need for this, this guidance. And once you've got your operations running smoothly, the, the, the simple things work, that's when you can have the more elevated conversations and move on to look at the big picture and the innovation and the rest of it. But if, if you are constantly firefighting, that will that will drain your resources. Yeah, if I can so just you, paraphrase, you, you, you say oh. there's a so you, sorry, Matt. No, you, you say there's a desire for prescriptive guidance, but if you look behind that, I think what you're looking at there's a desire for for certainty. Mm-hmm. And the question is, is 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 it feasible? I think you know, going back to Rob. It just gives you the illusion. If you're happy to live with the illusion of certainty, by all means, not prescriptive guidance. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's risky. It's, it's, it's tricky, this, it's tricky, this one. I, I, yeah. I understand, and I think there is, there is very much a differentiation between what I would class as kind of simple and complex work. And the more, the more simple, the more repetitive the work, the more prescriptive it's possible to be the more complex it's Kevin, isn't it um that the, there's different ways of dealing with those but uh, but i think the that the point is that there are you know huge multinational organizations and you lift the hood in it ops and support and it's shocking and there are simple things that can be done relatively quickly that will help to address that and and I, I I do, based on my experience, I I do believe that's true. And if you can help people who are struggling with the incident problem change type level, then that will free up a huge amount of time. Yeah. Let, let's ask ourselves why they're not. You know, let's ask ourselves why are they in that situation and. You know, sometimes it's historical reasons and, and you know, lack of the correct funding and emphasis in IT and, and so on. A lot of it is also because the world doesn't stand still long enough for people to put the processes in place that as fast as they're trying to do these things, there's a merger or an acquisition or they lay off 15% of the workforce or, 
you know, yada, yada. And these people are trying to work in an environment where the ground is shifting under them far faster than they can put processes in place. Mm -hmm. So this comes back to the deep philosophical things we're talking about, that perhaps it's not possible to put those stable processes in place because we don't stand still long enough to make it happen. Yeah, I, I, you have to you have to realize that if people have been brought up to think in terms of process, then their gut instinct when something goes wrong is to apply more process. And if you know, but if if you're if you work in if you're a politician, you'll you'll have completely different. You won't apply process. You'll you'll apply other measures. So it depends where you're coming from. This very much influences influences the the kind of solutions you see yeah and and i think I'll, I'll give an example of of what i mean which is um my doctor's surgery has an online system that they've rolled out so if i want to order a repeat prescription for my asthma inhalers i can log on to the system order my asthma inhalers so last time i went to do that logged onto the system to order my inhalers, you can't order these, you need an asthma check. So I then had to phone the surgery and they could check the records and say, yes, we can see you've had an asthma check recently, that should work, but what we're gonna do now is send you a link to a different system and you can order your medication through that one instead. So instead of something very simple that I could do and self-serve, that generates a phone call that takes some time that should be spent making appointments for people whose need was greater than mine. It requires me to interact with a different system. And, and this is where I think, this, this is where I, I see the, the basics of service management identifying improvements, because if we are messing up at that level, it adds time. It makes people's days worse. That receptionist, does she care about my prescription request? No. Should she have to speak to me? No. Should I have to speak to her? Absolutely not. But it's it's that level of, and I guess you could you, you call it toil from an SRE perspective. It's it's that level of of mess in the organization that stops us focusing on the big picture. While I agree that there's the, there's some really basic things that can be done in every organization that have potential and that and that a lot of organizations suck at a culture of continual improvement right i think i think that's the key is getting a continual improvement culture going to address those things so i think we can reduce those things but i think we also need to accept that as fast as we reduce them, we'll be generating them as well. Mm -hmm. So that it, it's that again, it's that letting go thing of understanding that our systems will be imperfect. So you know, something we say to our clients a lot is don't measure yourself against perfections. Like, so don't measure yourself against the idle blueprint. Don't measure yourself against um, how it would look if it worked perfectly, but always measure yourself against where were you yesterday and last year? And are you moving forwards and are you getting better? And, and so I think, Claire, some of those catastrophic organisations that you refer to, they can't honestly say that it's better than it was last year. Mm -hmm. They don't have that, that culture of continual improvement. So I kind of, I think there's two sides to it. One is, yes, absolutely, we can address a lot of these things and have a culture of continually improving. On the other hand, let's not beat ourselves up when it sucks, because everything humans do is going to suck, right? And that's just part of the human condition. And so it's a mixture of trying to feel good about being better while not trying while trying not to feel bad about being awful. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, that's really good. And a good note to end on. So I do want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to say. Where can people connect with you and learn more? What would you like our audience to do um, if they're interested in what, what your answers have been today? Rob. Teal Unicorn. Teal Unicorn. Google is your friend. You can find us. Yep. Yep. Highly recommend. Mark? LinkedIn, please. Mr. Smalley and Claire. So you can find me on LinkedIn and I'm still on 
Twitter slash X. Um, and you can also find the Scopism Siam community through the Scopism website if you want to learn a little bit more about Siam. Okay. And thank you so much for taking some time to be on Ticket Volume, you guys. It's been great. Thanks for the Pleasure. invite. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. It's been great to have you joining us. And for the rest of our audience, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast. We're going to do a drawing of everyone that's subscribed to Ticket Volume to give away. We have this book now called Introduction to ESM or Enterprise Service Management. We will be drawing for some free books, um, but you have to be subscribed to be eligible for the drawing. And it'll be really important because we're going to be changing the podcast a bunch in 2024. So make sure that you get subscribed so you're one of the first people to hear what we're doing. And for our guest today, what else are you looking for? We've got a ton of ideas of what we're going to build next year, but it would be way more useful if you told us what you need, because then we can provide more value to the community, that community that Claire and Mark and Rob were talking about in this episode. So we need your input. Leave a comment or email us at ticketvolume at invigate.com. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And speaking of ticket volume, did you know that this podcast is brought to you by Invigate? It's a fit-for-purpose service desk solution with integrated asset management designed to let you focus on supporting your organization to make a small bit of progress from day to day so that you know you're making success. In fact, service teams from Toyota, NASA, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so that they can focus on delivering better service because good service is good business.